Um, I am... Thank you, Serena. I am calling this meeting to order. Um, welcome to the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board meeting today. For the record, today is February 15th, and um, I am pleased to also remind folks that we have TVW streaming with us today, and our board, uh, this is a hybrid meeting. Um, before I take roll, I would like to announce that we have a new board member who's joining us today. So, former Representative Eileen Cody, um, has been appointed by the governor as our second consumer advocate. So Eileen, welcome. Um, many of you know, Margaret Stanley is our other consumer advocate. Eileen doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, she recently retired from more than 27 years as a state representative where she um, chaired the House Health Care and Wellness Committee. And uh, some of you might remember that she introduced the cost board legislation. I believe I was at one of the first national meetings when Eileen heard about the work of the Massachusetts um, team. And I remember her saying something like, you know, we should get this going in Washington. Um, there's all sorts of stories more about Eileen, but I think also what's really important is Eileen's been a nurse for 40 plus years and that unique nursing perspective really plays well um, to all that she does and all the great policy firsts she's done for Washington and our nation. So I'm very happy, Eileen, that you are joining the board and we are looking forward to your perspective, your input, and um, we're having fun on this board. So please everybody join me in welcoming Eileen Cody. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let's move now into roll call. Um, Lois Cook. Here. Great. Eileen Cody. Here. Bianca Frogner. Here. Thank you. Leah Hold Marshall. Here. Jody Joyce. All right. Staff, you'll let me know when Jody joins. Molly Nalette. Here. Thank you, Molly. Mark Siegel. Same staff, let me know if Mark joins. Margaret Stanley. Here. Awesome. Welcome, Kim Wallace. Here. Welcome, Carol Wilms. Here. Hi, Carol. Edwin Wong. Here. Great. I think we have all board members. Um, we will announce if the other two join us. Now, before we turn to our agenda, there are just a few very um, technical kind of items I want to share with you. First, um, you may notice that we no longer have chat capability in this meeting. Um, it's certainly chat goes on in some other meetings. Um, there have been some issues at other public board meetings, including chat bombing, and it can make meetings really difficult and pose a problem with public records. Um, this should not have a big impact on our ability to conduct a good meeting. And I encourage board members to use your hand raise function or signal physically with your hand. And if you can't get attention from any of us, jump in verbally. Um, but that is how we'll continue to handle questions or comments. I know you're not shy and that that will work. You'll speak up as before. Um, and of course, we're gonna take public comment live as usual and invite the public to also pose questions or make comments by email to the cost board um, email address. And we certainly get feedback and letters throughout um, the time between our meetings. On another topic, the legislature is in session, as many of you know, and I've gotten some questions about bills related to the cost board. There are a few bills moving through the process um, that suggest changes to our work, um, including additional members, additional public reports, creating consequences for entities that exceed the benchmark, all sorts of things. I think it's still too early in the process to know the final content of those bills. And so I don't think we should even try to predict the outcome or focus on that. We have so much work at hand that we know staff will follow up on the legislative um, bills that proceed. And we'll get a full presentation on any changes as soon as we they're finalized and as soon as we know. Um, 
I think that is it for our general announcement. I do also want to remind the public that there is closed captioning that you can enable and utilize. And I think we have participants that are doing that as well. Um, all right, Annalisa, why don't you um, move us on to the meeting summary and then I'll take us through the approvals. Will do, here you go, it's on your screen now. Great. So um, this is the approval of the uh, December meeting summary. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. Thank you, Lois. Is there a second? Leah will second. Thank you, Leah. Any discussion about the um, board meeting summary? All right, hearing none, let's move towards a vote to approve. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, the summary is approved. Thank you for that detail of our business work. Um, we promised to revisit the discussion. And so today, January, um, Angelus from Baylet Health is going to oh, talk to I'm going to I'm going to put you our next topic is actually I'm not sure oh. if, if you are back to back or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. Our next topic is about our state's excellent public option enrollment. Okay, date. thank you for catching me there. Annalisa, sorry, January, you got to just wait a minute. <laughs> um, let me just remind you guys that um, our next presentation um, is about our public option. And I bet many of you saw the press release. Um, I hope you're aware of the excellent news about the state's public option enrollment. Um, it's over 27,000 people, three times last year's enrollment. Um, and so we have some work to do related to that uh, huge jump. And what I'd like to do now is welcome Mandy Weeks Green from Healthcare Authority and Laura Kate Zeichen from HBE to tell us uh, the plan about what's going to transpire. Thank you, Sue. Good afternoon. My name is Mandy Weeks Green, and I'm the Coverage and Market Strategies Manager at the Healthcare Authority. I manage the Cascade Select Public Option Program and the Universal Healthcare Commission. And joining me today is Laura Kate from the Health Benefit Exchange. Laura Kate, would you like to introduce yourself at this time? Sure. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you again. I'm Laura Kate Zeichkin. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, and I'm a senior policy advisor with the exchange. I largely work on strategy and implementation of Cascade Care, which is our state's primary initiative to increase access to affordable quality health coverage on the individual market. Thank you, Laura Kate. We're here today to discuss the board's upcoming legislative report regarding Cascade Select. Many of you might be familiar with Cascade Select, but we'll start with a brief overview to ensure that all members are familiar with the Cascade Select program. Next slide, please. Cascade Select plans are the public option individual health plans available through the exchange. A Cascade Select plan has the same standard benefit design as Cascade Care plans, but Cascade Select plans also have additional standards and requirements, such as quality measurements and an aggregate reimbursement plan. The goal of Cascade Select is to increase the availability of quality, affordable healthcare coverage offered on the exchange to Washington residents. Cascade Select is a three agency effort involving the HPE, HCA, and the OIC. HPE is the lead agency for standard benefit design and makes the plans available through the exchange. HCA is responsible for procuring Cascade Select plans and the ongoing monitoring of the quality and affordability measurements. The OIC is responsible for ensuring that Cascade Select plans, like other plans, meet the regulatory requirements, such as rate review and network access requirements. In 2021, the legislature passed Senate Bill 5377, which required three reports related to Cascade Select. Mandy, oh, I see a question. If you'll hold oh, on, Sue, did you have a question? Mandy, I was just hoping you could advance the slides. Uh, that the board received. Thank you. Just to, I think one more, possibly. No, I think okay. I think that this has been pre-slide discussion. Okay. So she yeah, is going is. to talk about the announcement. This has just been an introduction, Sue, and Mandy will get to the stuff on this slide in a moment. Okay. There was not a slide specific okay. to the, the original. I have a little different deck. Thank you. 
No worries. Thank you, Sue. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, I'm glad we could clarify that. Um, so first, HPE is going to analyze the cascade select plan rates paid to hospitals and evaluate whether they have affected the impact and had an impact on hospital financial sustainability. And for the second report, the board must detail the effect that enrollment in public option plans has had on consumers. Finally, HBE will then utilize both of these reports to provide recommendations to the legislature before December 1, 2023. Next slide, please. So the board must report on the effect that enrollment in public option plans has had on consumers, including an analysis of benefits, premiums, and cost sharing amounts paid by consumers. The legislature designed this report to be part of a series of reports with the data pieces entrusted to the board because of the board's balanced and considered approach utilizing and examining healthcare data and costs in Washington. The board's report will not include other elements such as general recommendations on the public option or recommendations on procurement or standard plan design. The legislature has assigned those tasks to the agencies for analysis. Next slide, please. The report's timing is very critical because the final report is dependent upon the completion of the first two reports. We will begin today by identifying the various data that is available for the board's use and consideration. Next, we will email board members a survey to provide feedback, to identify additional data that might be needed, and potential questions for analysis that may be helpful for the board's consideration and reporting. Then staff will review the board member surveys, gather the available data, review the data, and conduct an initial analysis. At the June board meeting, we anticipate that we will present the data and initial analysis, including a rough draft of the report for the board's review, feedback, requested edits and changes. The plan is that the board will finalize and adopt the report at the July board meeting. I'll hand it off now to Laura Kate, who will provide an overview of the various data that is available for the board's use and consideration. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so as, as Mandy said, this really is focused on uh, analyzing the effect that enrollment in the public option has had on consumers. And that analysis has to include a uh, review of the benefits provided to premiums and cost sharing amounts paid by uh, consumers enrolled in public option plans compared to other QHPs. Uh, so this largely will be pulling from exchange data that we have available since the launch of public option in 2021, um, as well as some descriptive uh, analysis of some of the additional quality uh, and value requirements that HCA has in its contract. This really is uh, on this slide sort of an overview of the kind of information that we might provide um, to include Cascade Select premiums 2021 through 2023, uh, a description of the plan design and the associated cost sharing for public option plans compared to those non-standard non-Cascade plans on the exchange, uh, and then some description also about how enrollment and Cascade Select availability has changed uh, over those three years. You may recall that uh, there was limited availability across counties in 2021, as well as only about a thousand people enrolled in public option um, in 2021. That's compared to 2023, uh, where as Sue said, we now have uh, availability of public option plans in nearly all counties in Washington state, save for five counties. And we've also uh, reached enrollment of about 27,000 uh, enrollees in public option, which is more than 10% of the exchange's overall enrollment. So we're going to uh, pull from data like that uh, and provide um, narrative and charts similar to what you see on the screen here. Uh, and I think what we're interested in in the survey and as any initial feedback allows um, in the time today 
uh, your reaction to and feedback on data that you would like us to see um, or explore accessing uh, in order to put together a report that really talks about the effect that public option has had on consumers. And I think that's our slides. I'm not sure if we have time to solicit any conversation or feedback now, um, but we're very much looking forward to your feedback in this survey to help guide our analysis for you. Well, Laura, Kate, and Mandy, you have three minutes on the agenda. If a board member wants to talk about something they'd like to focus on or an area of curiosity about the consumer experience, um, you, you have three minutes to have at them so that they can they can take your comments to heart and shape their research for you. Any comments or questions? All right, thank you, Mandy and Laura Kate. If things um, do come up from the board members, we will direct them to you. Um, we really look forward to hearing the results of your data collection and um, I'm sure we'll learn lots from that. Let's move on to another important milestone for the board. Um, we're gonna review the first recommendation from our primary care advisory committee. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Emily Transu to lead us through the discussion. Emily, over to you. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. I am happy to be here. Can you be seeing me okay? Somehow I'm yes. not getting a... Excellent. And I am um, standing in today for Dr. Chibis Isenthul, our chief medical officer, who is away. So I'm delighted to talk about this topic. So, oh, as you know, the primary care subgroup has been working on this topic, and we're going to talk a little bit about the progress that they have made and what uh, next steps are from there and present an initial definition as well as sort of where that fits into the larger picture. We can go on to the next slide. I'm going to bring up the primary care transformation model, not really because I want to talk about it, but because I want to try to avert um, confusion. There's really the primary care spend work, which is what you are charged with working on. There is also the work of the primary care transformation model, which we've been working on, and I'll speak to you briefly. They are, they are connected, but by no means um, the same thing. So I mostly really want to just um, help clarify that distinction. The primary care transformation model is a piece of work that HCA has been convening since back um, in 2019, really working with payers, providers, and purchasers to talk about ways to support primary care better. This is a payment model approach. There are obviously many things that need to go into improving and supporting primary care. So, um, so just calling out that work that we have been um, that we've been convening, but that really is a, a big community movement amongst different players in this area. Moving on to the next slide, I'm going to focus here. I'll let you read the primary care transformation work on your own if you like, but I'm really going to focus on the right side of the slide, talking about the primary care statute and just reminding you of the work uh, of this group. So the Senate Bill 5589 laid out a number of components for this group to work on, which is really first off recommending a statewide definition of primary care, which for me as a primary care doc is just always harder than it seems like it would be. Um, secondly, to recommend payment methodologies, both for the claims component of spending and also for the non-claims based spending. Thirdly, to recommend ways to access and use primary care data. And finally, to recommend ways to achieve and sustain primary care expenditure targets with the goal of really bringing this up from somewhere in the 45% uh, range where it is now, 425, that is not 45, um, up to the 12% range. On to the next slide. So work that has been happening so far with this group has been to recommend a definition of primary care, and I'm going to present to you their recommended definition in a minute. A lot has, has gone into getting there. And then the second piece of work has really been around recommending measurement methodologies to assess claims-based spending. 
that involves a couple different components, which we'll speak to, and they have been working on that, but don't have a presentation yet or a recommendation yet to bring for you. Other components include recommending a method rest, measurement methodology on non claims based and looking on at barriers to access and use of data and how to overcome those. So that's work that's really still ahead of this committee. On the next slide, over time, the Advisory Committee on Primary Care has heard a number of presentations on claims-based measurement methodologies, and we have that information for you to resource if you want to look at more details on that. They have spent a fair bit of time um, really working from the OSM definition that was done previously, as well as learning that has come from other states. And really um, looking at a, a couple different pieces in the claims based space. So it's kind of the who and the where and, and the what, if you want to think of it that way. So, what services are being delivered, office visits, procedures, and other things, by whom? And of course, the question is who fits as a primary care provider has been one of the big discussions. Um, and then, and then where? So, you know, if you have someone who is doing psychotherapy integrated into a primary care office and setting, that probably is primary care. Someone doing that in a specialty clinic is probably not. So what we're really looking for is that intersection of the who, the where, and the what. The group discussed the provider codes and facilities. Uh, at their January 31st meeting. They got quite a ways through that, but there's some discussion to go. There's a lot of breakdown of the providers into different groups, and they've not yet gotten to addressing advanced practice nurses and PAs. There's no question that advanced practitioners are a huge part of our primary care workforce and will be included, um, but figuring out how to capture the ones that are primary care versus those that are really doing specialty care out there is something that they are, the group is still going to get to, as well as looking at the service codes. More, more ahead of them. On to the next slide. This is the final primary care definition as that the subcommittee has endorsed and wants to bring to you. And I'm actually not a fan of reading things out loud, but I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud anyway. Um, and this is a combination of the definition from the Brie and then also um, the, uh, I believe, NQF definition. So team-based care led by an accountable primary care clinician, that accountability is an important piece, that serves as a person's source of primary contact within the larger healthcare system. This includes a comprehensive array of equitable evidence-informed services to create and maintain a continuous relationship over time. This array of services is coordinated by the accountable primary care clinician, but it may exist in multiple care settings or may be de delivered in a variety of modes. So this definition is really trying to get to a functional definition of primary care. What is primary care doing? What is it intended to um, serve as a purpose within the greater healthcare system? We can keep going. There have been some pieces of feedback from the advisory committee of providers and from carriers on the work that's been done so far. There have been asks for clarification around how the definition will be codified. So a lot of work right now is really going into nailing down that who counts, which services count, we're really building on the work that OFM did previously, but bringing in some degree of additional nuance, uh, but still working through that. Because again, this functional definition doesn't really give us a what codes do we plug in um, sort of working, working document to creating that translation. Um, there have also been requests for clarification around how to reconcile different reporting requirements. There are lots of groups that are asking uh, for reporting around this and trying to get <laughs> to standardized definitions and really drawing that connection between the definition piece and the measurement piece. There's also an ask to add increased emphasis on social determinants, which I 
think was was well taken. There's a lot of discussion of equity already in that definition, but really wanting to bring in the importance of social determinants again there. There was a joint meeting of providers, the carriers, and the data committees on February 7th. They did not propose any additional suggestions for updating the definition. We can move forward. So the proposal for the definition is that this will serve as the board's guide for measurement, but that it would not be codified as a statute. Part of the reason for that is that we actually already have a primary care definition in the statute. Actually, we've got several. We've got one for primary care physician and another for primary care provider. I can read that out to you if you want, but it, it's very general. So, um, you know, it includes physician assistants, naturopaths, nurse practitioners, doesn't do any of that differentiation into what kind of work many of those folks are doing. So I think it's a, it's a good preliminary definition, but really isn't um, detailed enough to get to what the board needs to be, uh, to be doing in terms of measuring primary care. But we, of course, don't want to put something else into statute and have them conflict. So the idea is that this will be really a working, working definition and a measurement guide. No specific changes based on it to current operations. Claims-based measurement will be conducted in a way that's really similar to the methodology that OFM and the group that it convened uh, settled on a few years ago. There will be a preservation of the idea of narrow and broad definitions around claims-based payments. That's really turned out to be pretty helpful in both including including the, the fuller group when, when that's the goal, but also being able to really narrow down to the core functions. So we think that those distinctions are important and plan to maintain those. And then bearing in mind that the reference and the definition to equity does help to address the social determinants considerations, but also really thinking that a lot of the non cleanse based measurement, which includes more of that value-based care, more wraparound, services can really help to address the social determinants piece. So that may be our last slide. Interested yes. in people's thoughts, but this is really what the subcommittee wants to bring before you. So board members, what questions do we have for Emily? And if there are none, are we comfortable, um, is somebody comfortable making a motion to approve the recommended definition that our advisory committee has advanced? Because it would be great. For approval. Thank you, Eileen. Is there a second? I'll second, Lois Cook. Great. Um, is there further discussion about the primary care definition being proposed? Uh, this is Margaret. Um, I'm wondering what they mean by equitable. That, that feels like a, a question we could talk about for a long time. I think the The intent is really that that primary care plays a key role in in assessing the whole person needs of an individual and in bringing together their healthcare services and social services to help achieve. I want to say equitable outcomes for them because equity is really a, a population definition rather than an individual definition, but to make sure that someone has equitable access to achieving their health goals and um, and their life goals. I don't know if there's a, a way that that could be framed that, that feels better, but I think the idea is really to say part of primary care's role is to be taking that whole person view and, and addressing equity issues both on an individual basis and on a systemic basis. Thank you. 
Edwin. Hi, thanks, Sue. There is a point on slide or one of the prior slides that is um, perhaps some future work on me methodology to assess um, primary care from non-claim-based spending. I was wondering if there was anything to report in terms of follow-up steps there and if any of that work might influence the definition of, of primary care moving forward. Great question. I know the group hasn't tackled that subject yet. I think their plans are to look at the work that's been done in various other groups around the country to really look at, at bringing that in. And I know as we've done early work to, to bring in those components, um, there are a number of sort of best practices that are out there, even though it's very much a work in progress you know, capturing during claims is, is relatively simple, but really understanding, particularly how to allocate, you know, if a, if a carrier is paying a bunch of money to multi-care or the University of Washington to, to do value-based work and population-based work, how do you attribute that to primary care? How do you think about the different ways that money is, is flowing? How do you account for the delays in timing for a lot of those components as well? So I think those are the kinds of things that they're going to be thinking about, but that work hasn't really started yet. Will that ultimately reflect back on the definition? I don't know. You know, this definition is largely based in, in the pre-work, which spent a, a certain amount of time thinking about non-claims-based uh, components as well. So I think that the principles are right. Is it possible that there are that there are details that will want to be adjusted as they get deeper into that work? I think that's always a possibility. Yeah, and I guess just logistically, I wonder if there's some insights from that particular ongoing workflow or others as they continue as that work group continues to refine kind of operational definitions. I'm kind of curious if there's ways to, or if we have the discretion to kind of adapt this definition moving forward. Maybe that's a logistics question. I think that's a great question. I would think the answer would be yes, but maybe I should defer to others. Yeah, I, I would suggest since um, the Primary Care Advisory Committee is under our jurisdiction and guidance, I think we would refer any future kind of changes or as we know more about the evidence-informed services, we would refer things back to that primary care advisory group. So I, that's how I see the process flowing. Others, do you have thoughts or why don't we ask the birth mother of all this too? What thoughts she might have? <laughs> Not if you're referring to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I, I just think that uh, my actually the one question I had was why we didn't have any patients in the uh, primary care transformation model input. That was the one thought that I had about it. But it, I mean. How I just say it is I wouldn't expect everything to be perfect as we move forward. It's just trying to be moving forward uh, and that we'll learn different things about how to be equitable and uh, like evidence informed. So no, I, I think this is a, a good approach. Great, thanks for that input. Kim, I think your hand was up and then Bianca, you're next. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I support this definition uh, in that it, I think I really appreciate um, how uh, functional it is and that it's uh, this really describes, like you were saying, Emily, the sort of what and the who and the, the, the where, <laughs> you know, of primary care. The one thing that I, uh, it tripped over initially um, that I thought, oh gosh, you know, is there a piece that's a not here, and perhaps it was intentional. Um, the definition um, doesn't really state um, to what end or, or the, the aim of primary care. Um, and so I guess I found myself thinking, you know, in the middle paragraph, uh, it's a comprehensive array of services. And then I was, you know, thinking that I would read 
that to you know pr- that that opt that something supports promotes um, a state of health you know and well being or increasing uh, a person's um, you know experience of their um, health or ethics et cetera something something that is speaking about the the effect of primary yeah, care right. you know um and rather than oh to create and maintain a relationship so i, I saw oh so the array of services the it, it sort of it seems to me a little bit to be saying the point of primary care and the point of service delivery is to create this relationship presumably like a pcp relationship and I totally support that, <laughs> of course. But yeah. I, I did find myself wondering where, if there could be language about health, and and, and about um, the what this the person is actually um, the benefit the person is receiving or experiencing because of primary care. I think that is a great point. I will. Um... I will acknowledge that I I am filling in here and have not been part of all these conversations. So I don't know whether that was something that the group discussed, but I think it's a great point. And, and I think in my mind, it may have been one of those things that, you know, slipped in a bunch of revisions um, and, and eyes that had seen it many times sort of lost sight of that. So I think it would be very reasonable if, if this group wants to ask the uh, subcommittee to, you know, relook at that question, I, I think that would be very reasonable to do. I don't Kim, see any reason for it not to be that. Kim, I will point out though that their acknowledgement of that it may exist in multiple care settings gets at to that kind of, you know, whatever state of health you're in, we're trying to help you be at your peak wherever you are in the continuum, you are at maximum health and well-being for where you are. A uh, great point. Bianca, you were next. Yeah, thank you. Great discussion. Um, so full disclosure, I actually served on this free committee uh, that came up with the primary care uh, definition. And I can say that the committee struggled a lot with trying to sort out what was measurable primary care versus what was more aspirational of things that could be measured into the future. So I, I can see Kevin looking back at this definition that I think it, it, given that this is taken strongly from the free uh, collaborative is that uh, I think the definition is reflecting measurement and what was measurable <laughs> and health outcomes are really difficult to sometimes um, connect back to say the providers who deliver the services uh, what, what's easier to connect are the processes of care that happen in primary care um, rather than say, you know, uh, quality of life is a little harder to connect back to, say, uh, health care providers. So I, I'll, I'll just provide that little bit of context there. Um, and I, I don't know if the Brie Collaborative's uh, report was included as background material here because I do recall there being pretty good definition for every concept that's kind of identified here. Um, and, and a lot of it's taken from the literature more broadly. Now, I did have one actual question, which is um, around the discussion of kind of what's measurable. And also, I'm, full disclosure, I was on the OFM report too, trying to measure primary care spend. And uh, at that time, I mean, some years ago, but there was some discussion about other billing codes that are or have been available that capture the uh, social determinants of health and capture things like coordinated care. But I think at the time there wasn't much usage of those building codes. And I don't know if there has been an increase in the uses, usage of some of those billing codes as some insurers may be reimbursing for some of those services. I'm just curious um, if there was any discussion so far on the committee about uh, uh, maybe OFM's approach to try to capture concepts of team-based care or other things based on billing codes that may be increasingly used. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I, their time is passing. I'm hoping some of those codes are being used a little bit more that might give us some perspective on what else is happening in the setting. Um, if not, then I guess I'm curious what other kinds of data 
people might be discussing. And this kind of touches on Edwin's question about methodology. Thank you for that, Bianca. Mm -hmm. Emily, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I think there are there are certain codes that there are a lot of codes that are that are great and and continue to have low up, uptake. So, in thinking about both some of those direct social determinants codes, which I think are starting to uptick in in a few settings, but not in most settings. Again, because most people just aren't aren't reimbursing for them and it's an additional piece of administrative burden on providers to do those. So I think really, as we move into more and more value-based models where those are taken into account, I think we'll see the uptake, but I don't think we're seeing very much of it yet. Similarly for things like the collaborative care codes, which are a you know, direct measure of certain team-based services um, that they're out there, but uptake is low. The group really haven't tackled the non claims based piece, which I think a lot of this will play into much more directly. So I would expect more as they come back and report on that work, uh, a lot more discussion of those spaces. Sorry, so I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're fine. Um, thank you for that response, Emily. Other comments or questions or discussion before I call for a vote? So it does sound like we have about three things that we want the committee to keep working on. Um, I'm going to take uh, the prerogative of the chair to suggest that we go ahead and vote on um, passing this primary care definition. And then I think we can direct the committee in the future to come back to us with more around to, to get us started. And so we can get it into our legislative report to show our continuous progression on this work. But I think the three things we should ask the committee to get back to us and inform us in the future on are just kind of the measurable um, components, um, what outcomes or to what end um, does primary care seek to uh, create beyond that continuous relationship over time. And then just the whole, as we evolve into VBP, what do they, how do they see kind of the definition being expanded or the team-based care and the outcomes and whatnot changing? So I'd like to go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion passes. So we have um, the primary care definition that'll go forward. And I know Annalisa, you'll work that in to our um, report. And then I know Emily, you and Judy and others that are serving in this work will bring back that input from the board discussion. Will do, Sue, thank you. Great, thanks everybody for that robust conversation. Um, we're a little bit ahead. We've got uh, six more minutes till we get to public comment. Annalisa, I know that always kind of creates a problem. I hate to start poor January off and then interrupt her. Do we want to just take a quick stretch break or keep barreling through and pause, board members? Are you okay um, with me? I think given the amount of material we have to get through, I'll big January's forgiveness and get us started. There's a couple of introductory slides. We can kind of tee up what we're going to talk about and then We'll take a we'll take a pause in five minutes and then um, come back to the presentation if that's all right. And people can stand up and stretch while January gives her introductory material, so everyone's healthy and limber. Great, um, okay. great. Thank you, Dr. Transu and team, for um, all that lively conversation. Um, um, and for those of you in the public, you're, we're coming back to you here in a few minutes, but um, I think you all remember that we had a very robust discussion last year about our benchmark value and the economic conditions we were seeing related to the pandemic. Um, it's an important topic and we got lots of comments um, from interested community members and they are indexed in your um, materials. So January is going to, as we promised, revisit the discussion. Um, January is from Baylet Health, and she's here to talk to us about the impacts of both inflation and the pandemic. 
And at the close of her present presentation, we're going to have more discussion on what actions we want to take as a board. January. Great. Thank you, Sue. Um, Annalisa, do you want to drive the slides or do you want me to? I think you have um, it. So I'll go ahead and do it. Okay. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's been a while since I've been in, in, in these meetings. So it's nice to see everybody again. So um uh, as Sue mentioned, inflation is a, has been a hot topic, and it's it's something that's been in a lot of people's minds. We've talked about it in previous meetings, and as a group, um, the board decided that there was still time to consider the issue, given the timing of when the benchmark would apply and when inflation starts to flow through the healthcare sector. So we kind of left it open then, and noted that we would revisit the issue when the time was right. So today. I'm going to facilitate that discussion um, on what, if anything, should be done around inflation. Right. So I'm going to just uh, recap what we presented in the past around what we know about inflation and healthcare spending. Um, we know that increases in general inflation have an upward impact on healthcare spending. Um, we also know that that impact is lagged. Uh, because prices in the general economy don't uh, don't affect healthcare prices right away, and there there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, Medicare prices uh, they are updated annually based on projected growth, and the projections for 2021 and 2022 were low. Uh, commercial prices are defined within multi-year contracts, and oftentimes the terms of those contracts uh, span three years. And, and then Medicaid prices uh, change infrequently and generally are not linked to input costs, at least not in many states. So these are, um, these are the main reasons that general inflation's impact on healthcare spending um, is lagged. Um, in the next slide, though, we can see uh, the, this lagged impact in these data. Um, so the data in this slide is a little bit old now, but the point still stands. And what this shows is um, what was happening with inflation from January 2017 through January 2022. Uh, in, in the top right graph, um, you can see that in 2021, the price for goods shot up significantly. Um, the price for services, which is in the bottom left, um, increased some, but the price for healthcare services, which is represented in the bottom right, basically stayed flat. And so that's sort of consistent with what we know and what the research shows about the lag impact, that we don't see increases in general inflation hit healthcare right away. Um, the, the next slide uh, looks at a different measure of inflation. Um, the previous slide looked at uh, personal consumption expenditures, which is one measure of inflation. This one looks at uh, CPI. Um, but it is a, a more recent look at the impact of inflation. Um, and what it shows is that in 2022, the prices for medical care increased at a much slower rate than the prices for other consumer goods and services. Um, and, and there's also an analysis uh, conducted by Altarum, which I didn't include here, but, but that analysis showed that healthcare inflation was flat through the end of 2022, um, despite general inflation uh, being very being very high and high at a fairly uh, sustained level, right? So that's just some context. That's that's what we know about how inflation in general affects the healthcare se sector. Well, thank um, you, January. That if if that's that seems like a really good place to stop. It we know the context, and it's time for public comment. Can we take a pause for just a second, please? Absolutely. Great. I'll go back to that, and Sue, if you'll please. Um, open it up for public comment. You bet. So um, for members of the public, this is the time we have set aside for public comment. Anyone wishing to provide comments, please state your name and affiliation before speaking. You're also welcome to provide comments in writing at any time. And um, we publish the address on our website. But I will look to staff and look for hands for anybody signaling. Um, for public comment. You want to open up your line. I don't see any hands raised. And board members, um, I know you have in your packets uh, different various letters we've received as well. 
So we'll give it a minute more about public comment to see if anyone wants to jump in. I am not seeing anybody um, with hands up or jumping in. So I think January, we are going to turn it back to you. Thank you for that pause and for accommodating that. Go ahead, sure. January, back to you. Okay, we can go to the next slide, Annalisa. Okay, so um, this slide shows um, the six Peterson Milbank, uh, Peterson Milbank states and the target methodologies um, as that, that were chosen by, in, in these states. And so what you'll see is that Washington and all of the other states have healthcare cost growth benchmarks that are imp impacted by inflation somehow. Uh, the benchmark methodology in these states either explicitly or indirectly use a measure of uh, state economic growth that, that explicitly has inflation incorporated into the calculation. Um, Washington also looks at um, median wage and median wa and wages and income also um, are indirectly impacted by inflation because uh, household income tends to grow when inflation grows. Although um, the growth in household income is not quite at the same rate as inflation. Um, so all of the cost growth benchmark states methodologies, uh, when they were developed, uh, were developed with an assumption that inflation would continue at low levels. And the sharp rise in inflation that we've experienced of late over the last couple of years wasn't part of Washington and, and many other states' assumptions when the benchmark methodology and values were set, right? So next slide. Okay, so um, I think with that context, I think for, it's important to think about for at least a limited time, assuming that inflation isn't gonna stay at a high level, um, whether whether states should consider whether or not to allow for performance to exceed the benchmark due to inflation and or increased labor costs. Um, making such adjustments doesn't necessarily mean restating the benchmark, uh, benchmark methodology or the value. Um, that could be done by creating some sort of temporary allowance when assessing performance against the benchmark. Okay. And the next slide, we go through the pros and cons for doing this. And so in the first column, the left-hand column is sort of the arguments for adjusting for inflation and or labor costs. Uh, one is that states could lose support from providers and insurers who are accountable to the benchmark, uh, who may feel that the benchmark value was set using inflation inputs that are completely different from actual experience, right? It is legitimate. They can legitimately say um, inflation was assumed to be 2%. Um, when the benchmarks were set, it isn't 2%. In fact, it's much higher than that. Second reason is that the cost growth benchmark could be viewed as unrealistic, uh, unfair, and therefore not credible as a state policy. And this could lead to rejection of the use of the benchmark in contract negotiations between insurers and providers. Right? So, so these are the arguments for adjusting. On the flip side, um, in terms of arguments against adjusting for inflation, um, the benchmarks were, were purposely set using a methodology that was intended to provide long-term stability. Um, so that was, that was on purpose. We looked at um, long, long-term uh, long forecasts. Um, the other reason is that it's, it's unlikely that the benchmark value or performance against the benchmark would be adjusted if in fact uh, in, uh, we had deflation um, or if providers were posting record profits, right? So making an adjustment upward for inflation when it's not likely that a downward adjustment would be made if circumstances were reversed um, doesn't seem consistent or equitable as a policy. And then finally, creating an opportunity for an adjustment could open the door for calls to adjust the benchmark for various reasons in the future. So, so you know, could be argued sort of uh, arguments either way. 
Um, next slide. Okay, so, so why does this matter? Um, this is a quote from a Rhode Island uh, provider uh, who's a chief executive um, that, that illustrates the practical implications of this issue. And, and this executive told us that payers routinely invoke the cost growth benchmark at the negotiation table. So at least in some states, the, the benchmark has um, this practical applied value in constraining spending growth. Uh, particularly in the commercial market where price growth is negotiated. So we need to consider um, what's the implication of leaving the benchmark values as is and not accounting for unusually high rates of inflation. What's the implication of, of that um, for on those negotiations? And this is an important question because part of the, the underlying logic model for a cost growth benchmark initiative is that it will be used as a basis for those negotiations, right? So in the next slide, um, just talks about some, some key policy considerations, right? Within that context, here are some things to think through um, when, when kind of discussing whether or not to make any adjustments to the benchmark to account for inflation. The first is how should you balance protecting consumers um, who are facing slower income growth than inflation? Um, they're also facing potentially still a recession. So how do you balance that um, with being fair and reasonable to providers and insurers who are facing much higher costs because of inflation and workforce, workforce shortages? Second, what precedent will be set if you choose to modify the cost growth benchmark values or the way that you assess performance against the benchmark? And then third, if you're going to make that mo any modification, on what basis uh, do you make it? And for what duration do you, do you apply some sort of adjustment? Right. Um, next slide. Okay, so as you prepare to discuss this issue, it is helpful to know where other states stand. Um, some states have considered these questions and made decisions, others have not. Um, Connecticut began considering this in October and they're gonna be making a decision at the end of the month. Uh, Delaware started having discussions last month um, and has not yet made a decision. M Massachusetts made an upward adjustment of half a percentage point for 2023. Uh, Nevada's commission made a decision not to adjust, but left it open to revisit the topic later this year. Um, New Jersey hasn't broached the issue. Oregon decided not to make an adjustment, but in lieu of that, uh, delayed applying accountability mechanisms by one year. And then Rhode Island um, has adjusted its targets up by 2.7, 1.8 and 0.2 percentage points in 2023, 24, and 25. Uh, this, this is a little bit different um, and a little bit of a special case in that um, in, in Rhode Island, uh, the initial benchmark values that were set were set, um, were set through 2022. So the state had to establish new benchmark, a new benchmark value and methodology moving forward anyway. And so in doing so, um, the state set new benchmarks for the next five years, and in setting those, um, they built an allowance for the first three years to account for inflation, right? So, um, so that's where things stand. Um, states that have considered this issue sort of ended up in, in somewhat different places, and then in, in, in a couple more states, it's, it's still an unresolved topic. So... Um, I'm gonna stop there and open it up for discussion and ask the board about um, you know, your thoughts on whether or not to make a, uh, an adjustment and how you might, if so, how you might want to make that adjustment. Bianca. Hi, January. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm, I'm just not so clear when, um, there's a statement on the first slide that you presented that said that research shows that there has been clear impact of inflation on healthcare, and you said it again at one other point in time. 
but I'm not seeing that evidence in the slides that you presented. If anything, it seems to suggest that there hasn't been. So I'm, I'm wondering how the, uh, um, if you could just speak a little bit more about the evidence and the other pieces, given that the other, a couple of states uh, did change um, their numbers, what was it based on exactly? What Do you know? Right, so it's a lagged impact. It does impact, but it's lagged and the lag is about two years. So you won't really see, um, you know, uh, inflation that started going up at the end of, of 2020, beginning of 2021, isn't really going to show up until about 2023. Is that based um, on past research? Is that statement based on that? Because, I mean, so yes. far we, we won't know that, right? So, um, yes, and that's based on past research that we dug up. And so we haven't seen that yet in the current data because we don't have the data yet. But that is based on research that we presented a, a while back now to the board as well. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my sense about this discussion is that the inflation piece that many healthcare providers are particularly worried about is related to the cost of labor um, versus goods. But I, what is your impression about the conversation when we do talk about inflation? I mean, that's my impression is that I think the, the cost of labor certainly has been a, a hot topic, but there are many other pieces to the puzzle of what makes for the delivery of healthcare and that goes into the healthcare spending conversation. And um, so I'm just wondering also if you can speak a little bit to uh, what, what, how we should think about inflation, given that these two areas are fairly different markets, goods versus services. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's right that I mean, providers are generally concerned about inflation, but much more, uh, much more concerned about wage inflation and the cost of labor. Um, that's 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 gone up much more significantly um, because of labor shortages. So um, you know we have thought through how you might account for it. It's a difficult it's a difficult thing to account for. Um, yeah, but I, it's I, a difficult I, thing to quantify. I'd be a little careful when you say. I, so I, I I get that there's a lot of concern about health workforce shortages. I certainly am very aware of that, and especially around nurses. Um, but there are many people who work in healthcare, and I'm just wondering uh, if if you're seeing evidence of inflation of wages happening really across the board of all healthcare labor um, versus say particular occupations, where I think specifically in the uh, hospitals they are of course seeing travelers and so therefore this high cost of spending but we really have very poor data on that so i, I i'm just cautious i guess in, in thinking about what is the change we're going to make related to inflation when we i mean as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about this data i, I don't see a lot of information that's very helpful in identifying how we would change benchmarks related to this i i do appreciate the pain that I, I certainly have heard that hospitals are particularly feeling, but I do re recognize long-term care settings are also struggling to find labor. So I, I don't want right. it to come across. I, I, I'm not sensitive to those needs. I, I'm just struggling a little bit with trying to find how we would actually do any kind of adjustment. Right. Thank you. So um, go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead. Chandra. Uh, wh why don't we have Margaret ask, and then I can maybe comment um, on, like, respond to Bianca's question again. Too. Okay. Um, I was uh, reading the three letters that we got with interest, and uh, I think they were all very persuasive. The uh, impact on consumers of healthcare costs, especially with higher deductibles, which I think it is important that we study, and. Uh, what doctors and hospitals are experiencing, um, the losses that hospitals have had recently are, are kind of staggering. And uh, the points that they have made uh, about the impact of unnecessary, unnecessary administrative requirements coming from the insurers, I think is another thing we ought to address. But right now, I, I don't think we have the data or the information to make an adjustment for inflation. But we also, I think, should not uh, say, well, it's 3.4 percent, we're going to hold you to it. I, I think we really need to take a pause and see uh, what the data 
tells us as it comes in, uh, as the lag becomes reality on inflation. Um, and we also don't have any um, enforcement methodology or accountability. So uh, I think it's more in the messaging uh, to the provider and insurer community. Um, so in essence, I'm suggesting that we hold the benchmark, but say, we realize that you've been going through an inflationary period and uh, we're just waiting to see how the data comes in and it will consider an adjustment later if it makes sense to us. I think so, we have a, go ahead, Jenner. Um, just one, one um, comment on that is that I do think if you think about the purpose of the benchmark and you want that to be usable or, or used in negotiations, then you providers really need to know what that is prospectively. It's hard to make sort of the adjustment retrospectively. So that's just sort of a comment on that. Um, the uh, And then going back to Bianca's comment, I think I don't know, it, maybe it's helpful if we described how Rhode Island incorporated it. And it's just, you know, and Michael was much more involved in that, um, in that process, but there's, as, as I described, uh, PGSP or potential growth state product is the economic measure that was used. And it's, it's um, one of the inputs for the Washington uh, benchmark calculation. And a component of that is, in, is, is inflation. And instead of using the long-term forecast that is normally used for, for particular years, what the state did was they took sort of the actual inflation that happened and kind of said, okay, if we assume that there's gonna be a lagged impact and that, that lag impact is gonna show two years later, they took the 2021 inflation and put that into the 2023 um, calculation. So that's just an example um, of how that could be done. Um, there, you know, I think um, there are a number of different ways to do it. Um, and it's sort of, I think the goal, what the goal, the goal that the board sets out is, is important for figuring out whether or not to do an adjustment and, and how to do an adjustment. Wait, so January, I want to clarify that statement. You're reminding us that in our 70-30 blend, both our components have an inflation valve built in. You're saying that we've already captured a little bit for inflation, but we just, is that correct? Well, yeah. Okay. Um, the inflation figures that were used in, in that calculation was too Okay. Yeah, that's what I, that's, I just wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Um, Leah and then Eileen. Thanks, Sue. Uh, that was actually going to be my first question is the benchmark already accounts for inflation. What we're talking about here is some extraordinary and or unexpected inflation. So I think being clear about that is important. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, you had at the beginning kind of some different options for us to consider. I do think that the context is important. And as we approach analysis for the first year of presenting information about whether we as a state are meeting the benchmark and whether um, different systems are, this would be an extremely important part of that context and gives us an opportunity to kind of flex that muscle. So before I would want to see us thinking about the adjustment to the the benchmark itself, I'd want to understand a little bit about how we'll be sharing that data and what other context. And this is a clearly a very important one that should be um, that it should be made very clear that this can have an impact. And it could be something you know unexpected in the future as well. So is there are we building into our reporting mechanism when we report out on meeting and not meeting the benchmark? these important contextual factors, this being a primary one for this year. So, 
So there, I mean, the context is just, is sort of the context. There's no uh, sort of understanding that and 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 having that in the back of your mind as you look at the results is sort of what you that's what you do with it, right? There's nothing unless you actually make an adjustment. There's there's no other way. But it, but the recognition I think is important one. Um, and and just even even stating up front that we recognize that this these are unusual circumstances is also um, is is also important um, and you know an example of this is just uh, COVID years right so we've had now some some states that um, reported uh, cost growth over the COVID years 2019 to 2020 2020 to 2021 um, and a lot of a lot of entities, um, you know, in, in 2021 are probably going to show that they're they're going to exceed the benchmark because you came from a level you you had you you know spending was at a certain level it dropped significantly and then it increased uh, significantly as as offices opened up um, demand went up and so that was that was expected. And so that was um, that was understood um, by the providers and and the payers and the state that that was um, that there's nothing unusual there um, in in terms of seeing increases and seeing uh, providers and entities not meeting not meeting the benchmark. So. I think it would be helpful to have examples that we can draw upon for our reporting that includes important context like mm -hmm. you've mentioned. I mean, it could be, yeah. if it's this issue this year, as you mentioned, it's been COVID, yeah. it could be other things. Yeah, so that's all in the narrative, essentially. Yes, but it, it's really important context, and I just want to make sure we're building that into our process. Yeah. Eileen. Wait, Eileen, you're on mute. Thought I got it. Sorry. Uh, uh, I it seems like we don't have really enough information at this point, and especially since there's a lag time in what we see, and God knows we it's always reporting is always behind. Uh, how quickly would we, or you know, like what's the date? I guess that we would have to make a decision if we did want to make some kind of change is one. That's one question I have, and then the other question I had is, have we looked back? to do a comparison. The last time I remember wages going up like this uh, as a nurse, you know, I'll speak. I remember those good contracts. Uh, it was 1980. So have we looked back to see how that uh, in the 80s when we saw the same kind of wage increases that the, the nursing contracts are getting now, how that in, impacted uh, inflation, the healthcare inflation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, we have a, we have not done that research. Certainly, could could look into that to see what the impacts are. And and Bianca, I know you may be able to speak to that because I know this is this is an area that you um, study as well. Um, in terms of your other question about uh, how far ahead, I, I think it depends on what you think the benchmark's purpose is um, and, and whether you, you want the benchmark to be used as kind of a, a point of negotiation, right? If, if, if you think that that's an important component of having the benchmark is so that payers and providers can see that and they wanna try and meet that and incorporate that into their negotiations, then you really set that as far ahead as possible because as I mentioned, it's it's contracts are you no, normally negotiated on three-year terms basis. For the purposes of measurement, um, if, if we're just looking at measurement, um, 2023 data, will not be collected until 2024 and will not be reported until 2025. So there's that two year lag there. Um,
And if I could mention, I know, Junior, you mentioned that I might be able to provide some context. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges whenever we do benchmarks like this or look at spending is that when you start aggregating things across many places, you lose a lot of the nuances of what the individual organizations are facing. So yes. while nurse wages or other wages have gone up certainly at other points in time, it gets lost in the aggregate. And so that's that's one of the biggest challenges of doing this kind of work. So it, it's hard to say that there was a clear lesson to draw from that other than the wages that nurses may have experienced in terms of a growth back in the 80s kind of got washed out by other changes that were made um, elsewhere in terms of not everybody's wages went up. There were other groups that also experienced losses of jobs. So it's, it's a hard one, but I'm happy to look into it more if it's helpful. Yeah. Other thoughts about the board possibly making some sort of adjustment? Because I will be looking for a little bit of a motion here so we can give direction to staff. Um, I mean, at this point, it's sounding like people are saying, let's get more information and stay the course um, and see because of the time lag and because of when we would get the next series of information that we have time. That's, I guess I'd make a motion that we stay, and I don't know whether that requires a motion, uh, to, to stay with where we're at, and uh, but could continue to monitor and, and try and determine, get more information to see if, if there is a need for a change or how we would like to go about it. So I, I'm not, I wouldn't be prepared to have you change things at this point. Is so that is I would a second that Bianca. So, There's so, a, Sue, so, so can you phrase that as a as yeah. a short motion? Um, and then we'll yeah. have Bianca second it if she likes the way you phrase it. Thank uh, you. We I move that we hold the course for now. How yes, so I hear Eileen saying that the board does not want to just the benchmark, but that we want staff to continue to monitor and recommend on how we could approach an inflation allowance in the future as we have more information. Is that fair, Eileen? Is that what you were saying? And Bianca, does yes. your second stand? Yes, yes, my, my a second stand. So we have a first and a second. Let's move into discussion of that. If there's, oh, Lois, I see your hand up. That we, yeah. I just, I agree with, you know, kind of holding off on it. Um, I worry with being a small business owner, I worry about especially small, small clinics and the cost of employees and, and that being a bigger impact than what is showing yet. So I agree with, with holding off. I, I want us to be able to use it as negotiating, but I also don't want to reduce our healthcare resources in the state, you know, when we're already seeing we have a shortage of beds and hospitals per person and, and that kind of thing. Thank you for that input. Um, I think, Carol, your hand was up and then we'll move to Edwin. Yeah, I was um, inclined after looking at the state responses um, to hold the course we're just so, you know, those that have made decisions to incorporate inflation have been um, at this longer um, than we have. We're 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 so we haven't really done anything. Our our data hasn't informed us. So I think holding the course and and evaluating is is a smart move at this point for us. Thank you, Edwin. You're next, and Margaret, you're on deck. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with the general consensus here, but um, maybe just a request, I guess, as we continue to monitor this, I think in some of these slides with, with some of the data, would it be possible if we could get some kind of Washington specific measures on things like the, the inflation categories, the, the CPU categories as well. And also I think Bianca mentioned one of the particular areas I think we're particularly interested in is wage inflation. So perhaps um, some data on, on wage inflation, I think, um, we can get that if they'd be appreciated. Thank you for that input, um, Edwin. Margaret, your hand is up. Go ahead. Um, 
I would be more comfortable with the motion if there were some language in there that acknowledged uh, that we recognize that healthcare has been experiencing inflation, but we don't have enough data to make an adjustment. And so we are sticking with the, um, the benchmark that we already adopted, but we'll be looking at it in the future. I'm just concerned that the, the way the motion reads, uh, it just kind of says, well, we're sticking with what we said before. And I'm afraid it could be misinterpreted. Do you want to add um, a specific wording, Margaret, that Eileen can consider? And or let, why don't we just vote? Why don't we hold on? Let's keep taking. No, I think um, amend the motion of, <laughs> uh, to say uh, that we stay the course, awaiting further data on uh, inflation mark. Is that you think that says it, Margaret? Yes, that would be good. So um, let's go ahead, Eileen, if you'll accept that friendly amendment. I certainly and, will. Uh, Annalisa, did, your, did you capture that? I did, and we also have the recording. I'll be sure to capture it in the minutes of the board meeting so that it will, it, everyone can see it again. I, I don't wanna, I can't repeat it right now, but I'll make sure it's written out correctly in the minutes. Great, so with that, if there's no further discussion, I'm gonna call for a vote. All right, and we're voting on um, that we recognize um, the impact of inflation, but for the time being, we are holding off on any changes until we have further data good. to adjust as needed. Eileen, is that correct? Sounds good. And who was my second? Bianca, With I think. Five seconds still. <laughs> Great. And Margaret, is that a fresh hand up for discussion or we, can we take the vote? I, I forgot. Okay. Vote. Okay. <laughs> so all those in favor for the motion, signal aye. by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, Annalisa, you have a unanimous um, vote there. And thank you for the lively discussion in January for that information. And we will continue to monitor this closely because we absolutely um, know that there are impacts and we will respond accordingly. All right, so we are going to now move, we're ahead of schedule, aren't we? Yes, six minutes ahead of schedule. January is going to now take us into the Washington's cost growth driver analysis. Um, we're going to move into that discussion. January, right. over to you. Thanks. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so uh, during last month's board meeting, OnPoint presented phase one of its cost driver analysis um, that, that was developed uh, for the healthcare authority. I, I am not going to repeat the presentation, but just sort of to refresh everyone's memories, I just pulled out the and the highlights and key takeaways from that, right? So um, on point looked at cost growth from 2017 to 2021 and found that in this time period, uh, per member per month spending on medical and pharmacy services grew by about 25%. And there was um, an observed dip in uh, medical per member per month spending in 2020 due to COVID. Uh, which was then followed by much higher growth than preview, previously observed um, between 2020 and 2021. And that, that data, the analysis also showed some shifts in relative spending by, by category with outpatient hospital, uh, other professional and other medical spending categories increasing as a percentage of total medical expenditures um, while uh, inpatient specialists and prim primary care and long-term care decreased as a percentage of total medical expenditures, right? And then in the next slide, um, when looking at spending in the commercial market, um, we saw that three service categories, uh, hospital outpatient services, uh, pharmacy, and hospital inpatient services were the key cost drivers. 
um, and growth in outpatient services. Uh, these seem to be uh, driven by increased utilization, while growth in pharmacy and inpatient spending were primarily due to price increases, at least at this kind of high level um, uh, analysis. Um, on point also found geographic uh, variation in spending across markets, which is in the set next slide. Right. And, and so geographic spending across markets, which we know exists in many in, in many states. And then they also looked at spending on high cost members and found that less than 1% of the population in the ABCD accounted for about 15 to 21% of the spending. Um, that percentage depending uh, uh, varied depending on the market. Um, so um, next. So I think uh, you know with with those high level findings in mind, I think it's always helpful when when thinking about your data to know generally what's happening in other states. Um, we have looked at other states' cost driver analyses. And um, I think even at various points in time have presented parts of them to the board. Um, so we were not gonna go through them in detail. We, um, we didn't uh, prep for that, but what we thought we would do was highlight some of the top level findings we've seen. Um, and so these are some of those. Um, in Connecticut, uh, we've seen hospital outpatient and pharmacy services be the major cost drivers for commercial uh, spending growth. Um, with annual increases from 2015 to 2019 that averaged about 7%. Um, in Oregon, the main driver of commercial cost growth was professional services, so a little bit different. And then in Rhode Island, it was outpatient services and pharmacy services, which grew at an annual rate of around 5 to 6% in the commercial market. January, can I ask a quick question? Uh -huh. On Oregon's growth for professional services, do we know if it was specialty or primary care, or are we able to um, disaggregate that? What do um, we trying to remember, I might call on Michael to see if he remembers. I think this is an ag I think this was aggregate, not broken down. Okay. Thank you. Um Okay, so in the next slide, just sort of in that context, um, what I would say is that uh, Washington, sorry, Kim, you have a question? Oh, just a, for clarification, I was trying to uh, make sure I understood the 25% growth over four years that you shared on the slide, uh, the two previous, two slides right. previous, um, and that was 20 uh, 17 to 2021. Yeah. Um, so, and, and mm -hmm. then I, so 25%, that was, that was actually over a four year, over four years. That's not an right? annual growth. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then that, that's distinct. That's, um, uh, that's in comparison or contrast to the statement that you just made about the 7% averaging 7% annually yeah. for the, uh, stated years. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, for, okay. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that my brain was following the the bouncing ball here in terms of you know annual growth versus a percent a sort of eye popping percent growth over a period of four years, um, and so we've got a little bit of a mixed bag, and so it's important for us to take care with those distinctions. Correct. Right. Right. Um, you know that's a, I think if you look at twenty five percent over four years, that's probably annually around the same ballpark. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So, exactly. but yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out, Kim, mm -hmm. appreciate it. Okay, um, so I think, it, you know, in that context, um, it's probably fair to say that Washington's results are, are generally consistent with what we've seen in other states, um, particularly the finding around hospital and pharmacy services. Um, those two, those categories being being the drivers of overall spending growth in the commercial market. And so what this would suggest is that phase two analyses um, uh, dig deeper into these areas. 
Um, and so in the remi remaining slides, I'm gonna go over kind of potential drill down analyses that you could consider um, for phase two. Okay. So on hospital spending, I think you could think about two types of analyses. Um, one is an analysis of hospital price and price growth uh, overall and by hospital to look at variation in price and whether price increases are, are concentrated among specific facilities. Um, and something like this can be combined with a geographical analysis that looks at how spending in areas where, um, where there is greater concentration of hospitals compares to spending in areas where hospitals are less concentrated. And that can give you a sense of market dynamics and how market power is, is, is um, uh, impacting hospital pricing. Um, another thing you can look at is movement of services between the inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, so the on-point analysis showed a significant increase in utilization of outpatient services. And so it may be worth drilling down further to understand whether this is a net increase in these types of services um, due to perhaps a sicker population or whether these are services that um, perhaps used to be provided in the inpatient setting but are now being provided on an outpatient basis, right? So I wanna go over um, a few examples of analyses that um, Massachusetts conducted to better understand hospital costs, right? So um, between 2013 and 2018, uh, Massachusetts observed a decline in total inpatient stays among commercially insured patients. Um, and they observed this while, um, while spending grew about 5% per year during that time frame. And so to better understand this, they looked at procedures that were commonly performed in either, out, in either inpatient settings or, or outpatient settings. Um, and they looked at um, 11 of these surgical procedures um, listed here that accounted for a little over a fifth of the overall decline in commercial inpatient admissions. And so here you can see the decline in com commercial inpatient charges for these procedures, which ranged from sort of like 9% to uh, 73%. Okay. Um, next slide. So among the 11, they further narrowed in on three procedures to study a bit more. Um, and these are spinal fusions, mastectomies, and hysterectomies. Um, and sorry, Lois, you have a question? Sorry, uh, on the previous slide, I was just, uh, one of the things that really caught my attention from a previous uh, discussion was the lack of placements for people that need to be discharged from the hospitals not being available. And I'd be curious, I know Oregon has the same issue. I'd be curious to know how we compare to other states in that regard. Are we an outlier? And if so, you know, do we need to look at that <clears throat> part of the equation as well? So I, I I think that is um, that is an issue that is present in all states. Um, all states struggle with that, um, having to uh, keep people in in the hospitals longer than necessary because there's not an appropriate placement in um, uh, uh, another facility. Right? They okay. can't be discharged from home because they need higher level of care, but there's not. Um, a rehab facility or other facility where they can get kind of intermediate level of care um, available. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. All right, so, um, okay, in this slide um, is where they narrowed in on three procedures and the, the light blue bar represents the percent of these surgeries that were performed in an outpatient setting and the dark blue is the percent of surgeries done on an inpatient basis for these three procedures. And you can see that over time it's declined. The, the percent of procedures done on an inpatient basis has declined over time. So basically kind of confirming that shift from the inpatient setting to the outpatient setting. Um, the Health Policy Commission did other analyses that showed that the declining volume of um, scheduled inpatient procedures 
was not uniform across um, different types of hospitals. Uh, with community hospitals that served a higher proportion of patients in public programs, showing greater loss of inpatient volume. And so with that finding, they drilled down further, um, and let's move to the next slide. And they looked at the change in inpatient and outpatient volume by hospital system for one procedure. And in this case, it's hysterectomies, right? So in this graph, um, the hospitals, uh, hospital systems are sorted from top to bottom by the highest net growth in volume. And the red bar represents net change in volume, which combines changes in inpatient and outpatient volume. And then the light gray bar represents change in outpatient volume. And then the dark gray represents change in inpatient volume. And so what this bar, what this graph shows is that while most systems experience declines in inpatient volume, um, there were some that were better able to make up for that loss with an increase in services delivered in the outpatient setting. And, and that overall, the systems that lost like like lost volume as a whole on the net tended to be lower priced hospitals, um, community hospitals, while those gaining volume were more likely to include higher priced academic medical centers. And so, um, uh, uh, Eileen? Well, one of the questions I had in, in thinking about this is, do we, we're assuming that outpatient is uh, cost less, but do we really know whether that is true with well, so, some of the procedures that you like that they looked at, knowing that they, people would need uh, outpatient physical therapy uh, ra rather than the inpatient, you know, just receiving everything when they were admitted. I know, you know, we usually believe that it's better care if you can do it when they're not admitted, but I just I don't know that we've actually ever done those those quality studies and the cost analysis on it. Right, right. And I think this is this is um, so th I think that's what Massachusetts was trying to get at in this analysis, right? So there's the in inpatient to outpatient shift, but the outpatient inpatient to outpatient shift isn't happening necessarily within the same hospital, right? The the outpatient procedures are being conducted. Um, more by higher cost academic medical centers, at least in, in, in Massachusetts, right? So what this shows is not just shifts in settings for specific procedures, but also cross provider shifts in where that, um, where the outpatient care is happening, um, right? So, so this is, I present this really just as an example of a hospital drill down analysis that gets at some some pretty complex market dynamics and kind of walk through kind of one by one how you can start from a high level and hone in on particular um, issues that you're, you know, that that you kind of that show, you know, weird patterns or strange strange patterns and how um, how you might go about kind of peeling the layers of that onion. So this is, you know, this is just an example of that, right? <clears throat> so um, the other area of spending that um, may be worth digging deeper into based on the analysis that on point presented is, is pharmacy. Um, and here are some ideas for analyses that, that um, Washington can consider. Um, first is an analysis of retail pharmacy spending overall and broken down by generic versus brand name drugs. And that can look at, you know, per member per month spending on these drugs, uh, price per unit and utilization using some sort of standardized metric. Uh, another type of analysis is to look at retail pharmacy spending by drug class or drug category. And so, um, in the next slide is an example of a pharmacy drill down analysis that Rhode Island performed. Um, so Rhode Island, um, when it first started digging into data, um, a lot of the analyses were a bit more ad hoc um, to focus on particular issues. Uh, but more recently, uh, Rhode Island developed a dashboard 
that can, uh, and it's an internal dashboard that can show medical and pharmacy spending per member per month. Um, and it can show annual changes in that spending payment per unit and utilization per, per thousand. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Rhode Island had identified pharmacy as a significant driver of commercial cost growth uh, between 2017 and 2021. So it's one of the, and it's one of the reasons that the state hasn't been able to meet its cost growth target. So the state, uh, conducted some focus analyses of pharmacy spending to better understand what's driving cost or spending in that area. And Rhode Island's dashboard allows it to look at brand uh, name drug spending uh, to see where spending was highest by drug category. And here what you see is um, uh, that seven categories of drugs accounted for almost all of 2020 spending. Um, and spending on immunological agents was at the top, accounting for $152 million in aggregate spend. Eileen, is that from, I don't know if that's from before or you have a new question. Okay. Um, so um, Rhode Island dug deeper into immunological agents. Um, there were other levels of analyses that Rhode Island conducted before getting to this one. Um, and those analyses showed that volume and price increased significantly between 2017 and 2021. Um, so um, that's for immunological agents as a whole. So they, they look then specifically at four drugs in this category. And this table shows the drug, the associated price per unit and units per thousand in 2017 and 2021. And what you see are very high prices per unit in the range of several thousand dollars for these drugs. Um, in addition to that, the price for these drugs are increasing annually or uh, at very high rates, um, between uh, 7 to 11 percent per year. And in the case of Humira, um, the top drug here, which came on the market in 2019, it was a price increase of 20 percent since it was introduced in, in 2019. Right. So again, this... Um, this is just another high level, uh, this is just another example of how um, uh, Rhode Island was sort of peeling back uh, the layers of, of the onion and what, you know, what kind of they, what they came away with was it's, it's what's going on is, you know, high prices. Um, these drugs are being introduced into market at very high prices. And in addition to that, they're, they're growing at a much higher rate than other services are growing. So um, again, that's just an example uh, mm -hmm. taken from Rhode Island um, that you can consider. And, and this slide here lists potential phase two analyses that HCA has discussed, I believe, with OnPoint. Um, I think these were presented at last month's board meeting. Um, and so, um, some of the analyses that I went through, I think, fall under sort of the last two bullets here. The how are you? How are utilization changes impacting spending? How are price changes impacting spending? Um, and so, the I think the goal what HCA would like is to have a discussion on how um, what types of analyses to prioritize and conduct uh, for the next phase. So I will leave it there and open it up for discussion. Thank you, January. So board members, um, all really captivating information as we see how Massachusetts is peeling back all of their information. And we have to direct staff about where we think they should um, do deeper dives. So I open it up to you if you have thoughts about things like the high cost patients or regional impacts or um, settings in hospitals, pharmacy, where do you think we should direct staff to go? Go ahead, Margaret. Well, one thought I've had is that I think we should focus on areas where the state of Washington can have an impact. Uh, there are some things which can really only be addressed at the federal level uh, to make any big difference. 
And I think some of the pharmacy issues are there, not that we really expect them to do anything about it, but um, so uh, areas where purchasers or uh, the legislature could actually um, impact change. I think that would be an area to focus on. Thank you, Eileen, you're next. Well, I, I, I'm very curious about the huge change in out, the hospital outpatient spending. And you know, then I think about where is it different in uh, where there's uh, ambulatory surgical centers this competition with them. Uh, so I, I'm just, I think a drill down in that area as to if, are we inflating costs there or I mean, are we actually saving money by doing that, that many more things outpatient? Um, so I hear you saying settings and take it even further beyond inpatient surgeries and outpatient surgeries, but look at the um, data we have on ambulatory surgeries as well. Yeah, yeah, because that's, I know that's where some of the competition has come in and you know, hopefully would, uh, we'll see if it makes a difference in the pricing. Yes, uh, Bianca, I see your hand up next. Yeah, thank you. Gosh, there's so many things that could be looked at. <laughs> uh, where, where, I mean, where to start? I, I guess one thought um, of things that one could look at, uh, some of it related to trying to understand whether the shifting, what kind of shifting is happening between inpatient and outpatient is taking a page from, I think it was Massachusetts, where they looked at some of the procedures where there was significant decline. It would be helpful to pair that with seeing what was there a similar increase of, or what happened to those procedures in the outpatient setting? Because I think there's some, it's somewhat it's being implied that by, uh, that, that we're automatically changing services from a, one setting to another, but it'd be helpful if we actually could see like what, what the growth of those services that we saw decline in the inpatient setting experienced in the outpatient setting, and then figure out kind of what's the spending associated with that change in the service utilization in the outpatient setting for those same sets of services is what's being defining in the inpatient setting. So that kind of paired analysis would be helpful. And then I think the one other question I have, and I'm guessing the answer is probably no, is for the farmer school piece, it, it would be helpful to compare baskets of goods across other states. So if we look at anything around pharmaceuticals, it'd be helpful to, to use the same basket. But what I'm wondering is, whether we can get to anything around the role of pharm pharmacy benefit managers. It, because I think over this last several years now, where we're seeing in those other states, there's a growth in the spending. Um, I can't help but wonder what the role of the PBMs are as part of that, because that's also been growing. I, I just realized I'm not so sure where you would get that data. So that's all I have at the moment. Thank work, you. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Bianca. And I remind everybody that we have two very significant pharmacy um, groups, committees working on drug transparency. And then we have a drug affordability board that um, is getting stood up. And we may ask staff to go and figure out what work they're doing that could be piped over or shared to us and not duplicate efforts. But thank you for those comments, Bianca. I think Leah, you were next and Carol, you're on deck. Thanks, Sue. Um, can you can staff remind us of the conversation we just had about definition for primary care and primary care spending and when we might see that? I really like pairing something that you know evidence um, supports is high quality and leads to better health outcomes and could prevent some unnecessary costs with things where we're trying to figure out where there are other drivers. So I don't, I wouldn't want to pick primary care and behavioral variation until we understand the spend, but I can't remember where that is in our work plan. Annalise, so, do you remember the date for primary care data to be coming back at us? Um, it, it probably won't be for some time. We just got our first recommendation. We have three more to go. They'll be, and we have not started the implementation planning for the actual um, 
uh, for the implementation of a data call. However, OFM, you know, we'll be using OFM's existing primary care data call for now and into the future. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Carol, I see your hand up next. Yeah, um, maybe building a little bit on what Leah had said in correlation, you know, we're living in such a time of, of technology, evolution of healthcare, and, you know, not only competition, as Eileen has, has stated, um, but but just how how quality care can be delivered today. Um, and when you look at a time span from 13 to, to 18, um, you know, some of those conditions, you can access care in an outpatient setting, it doesn't have to be done in an inpatient setting. Um, and so how can we capture those those instances and, and really dive into that, lean into that? How is that affecting um, overall spend? The, the second to last bullet um, that January has in there, how utilization changes are impacting spending with regard to prescription drugs, um, you know, where there may be an increased use. Is that also uh, correlating the not diagnosis to less care in a hospital hospital setting. Um, I, I like the idea of us really correlating, um, you know, cause and effect, and then just how evolution of healthcare shift in healthcare, how we as consumers are choosing to use healthcare different. Um, pandemic really sped that up quite a bit, just in. Um, how we want to interact with providers on therapy, be it behavioral health, physical, and more of a tele telehealth environment. Thank you, Carol. I, it sounds like the board is coalescing first and foremost around this notion of a focus on outpatient costs and the major procedures and the from inpatient to outpatient. Can I can I get confirmation on that? That's what I'm hearing. Everybody kind of saying that one's really important to mimic some of what um, has been done in Massachusetts. Anybody opposed to that idea as being one of our lead topics for staff to drill down into? I also would urge us to think about the high cost clients because I do think because of the difficult to discharge issue, I, I'm wondering if there isn't something um, more that uh, the team, January and On Point and staff could work on about um, the chronic conditions and the really the complex co-occurring, these are the really difficult cases and how that's impacting costs too. Just not sure how we're going to get our arms around that with length of stay or what we're going to be able to produce there. January, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, there are, I've seen other analyses around chronic conditions, what are sort of the top, you know, top um, conditions in terms of spending. I guess my comment on that is I would just go back to Margaret's comment on what is it that the state can do around this and, and, and to address it? And so, and kind of focus on that. Um, I think the, there is definitely recognition that that's, um, um, those are, they're a small portion of the population and they drive costs, but um, in terms of kind of policy levers that are available to the state, um, they've been a little bit limited. Um, and so I would just think about that. Um. Yeah, good point. Um, Eileen, I see your hand up to continue the conversation and then Bianca, you're on deck. I just had a question about the high utilizers. I'm assuming that the WISIP population is included in the data. Uh, that's because that they didn't get they don't get called out as anything separate, but uh, I don't know whether January, if you can tell us that or not. Um, sorry, remind me. What's the with that? With well, that's that? it's our high risk pools. What how? Okay. What you normally? <laughs> um, I would defer to on point for that analysis. Um, I'm trying to remember what the, um, you know, basically if it's in the APCD, 
if they are um, re required to report into the APCD, then it, it's likely captured. We will check on that. I mean, I believe they are, but we will confirm that with our our, our team, Vishal and On Point. I don't. I see Vishal is on, and uh, Vishal, if you can come off mute, if you're able. There. Yeah, absolutely. So my apologies. I was distracted. Could you repeat the question, please? It, are the high cost, um, the risk pool, was up? Are they in the APCD? The cost um, related to those clients. As long as the claims were paid uh, as part of one of the payers that submits data to the APCD, then yes, that data would be in the APCD. Yeah, I believe I mean it's in. Yeah. Bianca, your hand is up. <laughs> uh, I'll just offer a couple more suggestions of things to look at. I, I think, Sue, actually, your idea is not a bad one there to ask about length of stay. I mean, if you could look at some of the uh, most expensive, um, you know, patients, for example, in the inpatient setting, and if you could identify length of stay to see if that's changed much over time, <laughs> that, that could be potentially helpful. Um, and I think any analysis that is done, it would be helpful to kind of get a year by year change in comparing to the pre COVID era because there's a lot of noise. So I would just caution that there be any kind of grouping of years too much, but I recognize that there's kind of a slowdown um, of uh, data or that you kind of get small numbers and that's an issue. But one other thing, so think about patients with multiple chronic conditions. I'm wondering if you can identify patients with multiple chronic conditions who are getting served in outpatient setting and seeing what's the different mix of services that might be had by patients in, in those outpatient settings. Because I think the concern that our group certainly has had is whether patients get access to the care that they need. And one way to get some sense of what it is to figure out what is the care that some of our high needs patients are getting in that uh, outpatient setting and how has that changed over time? So I realize that those are a lot of work uh, to ask for, but um, I'll just offer those as suggestions. Thank you for that, Bianca. I think um, we need to come to some agreement. I, again, I go back to, I think everybody feels strongly about the um, outpatient shift and the procedures and understanding kind of that better. And so we would direct staff to again, mimic what has been done in Massachusetts about the, those shifts so we can better understand that. And it sounds like our second area um, might be coalescing around high cost or regional variation. So I'm just trying to suss out what is the second thing we really wanna direct staff to do a deeper dive into. Margaret, I see your hand up. You're, you're on mute, Margaret. Sorry. Sorry. I don't have a suggestion uh, about that in particular, but uh, more in the way the data would be displayed. You know, in the letters that we received, it was pointed out that we have fewer hospital beds uh, than many other states. And um, so I think it would be useful to look at uh, the data in terms of per member per month or cost per case when you're looking at inpatient versus outpatient rather than total cost. Because when you have fewer hospital beds, those who are in the hospital are likely to be sicker, perhaps have a longer length of stay, especially if you've taken the easy surgeries like total hips and total knees and are doing them now outpatient. So I think how that data is displayed is very important. Thank you for that, Margaret. Um, January, I and uh, Annalisa, it feels like we're very clear about our drill down um, into outpatient and with the sensitivity, it sounds like we um, are going to direct staff to work with our pharmacy team to see what they have going over there before we start going into pharmacy, although I think that still has to be on our list. 
for the future. I just don't want to duplicate efforts. Um, it sounds like primary care is kind of too soon, um, that we need more work done there before we'll get things that are more actionable. Is there another area that I am missing that people have brought up that I, Leah, I see your hand up. I, I do think just digging a little bit into the stat, it's not totally surprising, although I was a little surprised by the spread of 1% of patients account for 15 to 20% of care. To just understand you know, what the top 10 conditions are as it relates to those 1%, because it's going to be different than the question we have here around chronic conditions. That's, you know, diabetes impacts much of the population and also has an impact on spend. But I think maybe taking a little bit of a dive into that one can help us understand the outliers. We made decisions early on about um, where we include outliers and where we don't. So then we would have a little bit better sense of those cases. So kind of think you could block it by grouping of both um, condition and then also spend. So are there 10 cases that are $20 million and then they fall into, you know, what's the spread of that outlier spend in that 1% group? Great, I think that'll help us. Yeah. A lot we can do with it, but I don't think it'll take too long and it will just help us understand that, that what we're including and excluding. Great. So I think we've kind of landed in these two arenas for staff to assist us doing a deeper dive. We're going to kind of go further with that second topic of just better understanding the complexity, the our difficult discharges are, yeah, what's that variation in the spend? So um, thank you all for that discussion, Annalisa. I hope you feel like we've given you guys enough direction to um, noodle on this and come back to us with deeper dive information. Um, so. Thank you. Before we adjourn, I need, unfortunately, to turn this over to Annalisa for a very important announcement. So Annalisa, back to you. Okay, I'll be very brief. Um, it's with mixed emotions that I let you know that I've taken another job and I will be leaving HCA and state government work. And my last day is February 28th. Um, and uh, truly the highlight of my time at HCA has been launching this cost board with all of you. I've truly enjoyed getting to know each of you and I have great hope and heart for this work as it moves forward in making healthcare costs more transparent to purchasers, policymakers, consumers, and all of us. And I know the work's in good hands with this board and our partners at Peterson Millbank and under Sue's leadership and with HCA staff, including Michelle, and who's already working to find your next director. And just again, I wanna thank each of you for your energy and commitment to bringing this idea to where it is now. And I look forward to watching you as a member of the public as you move it forward. So um, that's it, Sue, thank you. Thank you. We're not, we're not happy to hear that news, Annalisa, but we appreciate all you've done and we understand choice and kind of where things are in life. So board members, um, I know each of you are uh, joining me and thanking Annalisa for really launching seating and launching this very important work. I wanna thank you all for attending today. I will remind you that a recording and summary will be posted shortly on our website. Please mark your calendars. The next board meeting is on Wednesday, April 19th from two to four. And with that, I am adjourning this meeting.